the goal was to shoot it so that the the head, the eye, the bill are all sharp, which this one is. And then I just wanted it to melt away after that. Once I kind of saw how they were flying in the areas they were flying through, I was able to change my position to take advantage of it. All right, and thanks everybody for jumping in. This episode is gonna be talking about waterfowl photography. I've got a two segments. We're gonna do the first segment with just some basics, talking about how to uh, actually approach waterfowl. And I broke it down into some, to some basic topics. We'll talk about light perspective and environment. Before we get into the pictures and the images, I tried to bring in 40 or 50 images to show uh, and reinforce some of the concepts. We are gonna talk a little bit about gear but I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on, on gear. I am gonna talk a little bit about settings, but not spend a whole lot of time on settings as well. So before we get into the birds themselves, let me talk about just waterfowl in general. I've always stated that I thought the toughest type of photography is raptors, but raptors, even though they're challenging, you don't get a lot of looks, but the experience can be very rewarding, especially if you're doing hawk watching or something like that. Now, the second part of this is that waterfowl is the next most challenging and while the results can be extremely rewarding, it is probably more frustrating than any other type of photography. Imagine yourself getting set up, whether in the water, on the side of the water, waiting patiently. Uh, you've got a flock of ducks out in the water and they spook and the whole flock flies out and never comes back. And you've wasted a trip, great light and uh, preparation. And that's happened many times to me this season. One of my target birds was a buffle head. I'll show you at the end but uh, I made 10 trips to try to get a buffalo head this year and I was within 10 or 15 feet one time and I never had an image until last week. So yeah, it can be very, very, very difficult. When you're starting with waterfowl in general and you're just practicing, I would encourage everybody to, to use tame ducks, even mallards. Uh, find a local pond and not all tame ducks are mallards. You can have uh, any, any species that's around people or in a park but try to find a local park where you can practice some of these techniques. Again, the light, the perspective, and, and including some of the environment. So I think you'll benefit from the tame ducks. Wild ducks are a whole different story. Um, they're very, very skittish, hard to work with, and it's gonna require um, some concealment or some strategies to get comfortable or to get, get the ducks comfortable with you. So in terms of lens and body, lens 300 to 600 is the range with almost all bird photography with the tame ducks. And if you're in an environment where you can get really good looks, 300 might be enough. Otherwise, you're looking probably at five to 600. I do use teleconverters sometimes. Not all ducks are the same size. So smaller ducks like buffle heads, uh, gadwalls, wood ducks, um, grebes, those are a little bit smaller. You might need a teleconverter or a longer lens for those. Bigger ducks like mergansers, American blacks, uh, those tend to be a little bit larger shovelers and you might be able to get away without a teleconverter um, or even a little bit shorter lens. So the two specialty pieces I wanna talk about real quick. I did a quick Google search for something called a ground pod. I'm just gonna fly through here and show you a couple. Uh, this image shows a drill and a frying pan and that's what I did. Uh, there are some commercial versions available I'm just going to flip through here so you can get an idea of these types of setups. You'll see some on gimbal heads, some on tilt heads, some on ball heads. It's all just trial and error. Figure out what works for you. These ground pods, here's a good picture of a ground pod that's got a camera set up about probably 8 to 12 inches above the ground, which is uh, the max height that I would suggest for shooting waterfowl. Uh, I personally do not use ground pods. Oh, also tripods. Here's a tripod. This is a mini tripod. Um, and you can use a full-size tripod, but you're going to be in the water probably or have it flattened out. With this specific one, you can see that this is a flat base. There's no pole going through it. So these are designed to actually flatten out all the way. Um, and that's one of the advantages of this type of tripod. And all, uh, all the high-end manufacturers bake that. All right. Um, I don't use a ground pod. I actually like to get lower than the ground pod allows me. So what I do is just set up uh, over my hand. So I lay my hand down on the edge of the water if I'm shooting from the shore. 
and I tilt my, I rotate my body so I'm kind of sideways so I don't necessarily need that right angle viewfinder. Uh, I will show you a picture of what a right angle viewfinder looks like. There was one guy in here, I hope I don't get sued for copyright infringement. Um, but this guy, you can see he's looking down. If you've got a bad neck, these right angle viewfinders can really help you out. The bad thing is it's a little bit tougher to track with those and if the birds fly, you, you won't get flight shots at all. Depending on the manufacturer and the body, so the pro bodies for Nikon, these uh, right angles screw in and screw out. That makes it really tough because you can't just pop it off if the birds fly. On the consumer level body, so like the D7500 and below, that is a slide on adapter. So literally you can slide it on, you can use it, and then if they move or you want to take it off, you literally just pull it off. Uh, when I shoot shorebirds, I use that sometimes, and um, for the slide-on, I actually like it better than the screw-on. So uh, Canon, I think both, all of theirs, I think slide-on, but I'm not a Canon shooter, so somebody in the comments could, um, could correct me on that if I'm wrong. So those were the kind of the specialty equipment. In terms of clothing, you're going to need waterproof something. If you're on the shore, I still recommend, I use a brand called Frog Talks because they're cheap and I can just throw them over. I keep them in my trunk. But any overalls work, anything that's waterproof um, should be fine. Now, with the in the water, it's a little bit different. You're going to use waders. And for in the water waders, uh, there's different thicknesses. So some will provide you more warmth. And then there's going to be some that are just there to protect you from the water. Uh, if you do buy waders, I would suggest getting them as tall as you can. So ones that are cut way up high into your armpits and then as, as high as you can get around your neck because you're not going to be standing in the water fishing. You're going to be probably sitting in the water. And again, we want to get a low perspective, so you're going to be as low as you can. I was talking to somebody and they said I was in the water and I thought I could get low, but I couldn't. So as I was looking down, I couldn't get low enough, so I had to raise my camera. What will happen is if the camera's too low and you've got waders on, you're going to try to bend or lean forward and the water's going to go down your waders. And I've had that happen and I know people that have had that happen. If you're in the water in that situation, that's where that right angle viewfinder can be especially a lifesaver because it's going to allow you to put the lens down another four or five inches, uh, maybe even six or seven inches, and that will prevent you from getting that water uh, down your waders. All right. So that was a quick background on uh, tame, verse, tame ducks versus wild ducks and a, a, just a quick brief talk about the gear. So let's get into some birds. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is what type of light to use. Golden hour light works for everything. I've always said that it works great for ducks. And you're going to see a couple of them that have iridescence on the head. This is a shoveler. Shovelers will look black in overcast light, but I wanted to show you what they look like in direct or golden hour light. Um, so this was at golden hour and I'll kind of flick through here and you can kind of see these really nice tones uh, The water reflection here and you could see all of the nice tones that are picked up during that first or last hour Now whether you decide to shoot in the morning or at night There's a couple of differences the night advantage is that you're going to be able to find the ducks study them See what they're doing and then set up for the last hour of light the morning ducks are much more difficult but a lot of times, if you know the area, they'll fly in and fly out in the morning. And if you can get set up before they fly in, you can kind of be ready and take advantage of the early morning light. So if you've got a spot, a regular pond, and you study the behaviors, you're going to see, and I'll show you some example from uh, Ray's portfolio of ducks that he just, he absolutely knows when they flew in. And uh, he would be there on several mornings a week, and uh, he absolutely just nailed them. This is a female shoveler in Golden Hour. That's a gadwall. He's actually had a little deformed bill. If you know anything about ducks, his bill's a little shorter than it should be. It's a pied-billed grebe. Again, you can see those nice bronze tones on the back of his neck. Another merganser. Really nice light there. And wood ducks. That iridescence on a wood duck is really going to look great. Um, it can be overpowering. They almost look comical sometimes if you get them in really strong direct light. So when I see wood ducks in direct harsh light, uh, I don't like them at all. But they look really nice when you're just suggesting that iridescence and not just um, making them look like a cartoon character. These are cinnamon teals. This was a goal of mine a couple, last year actually, about a year ago. Um, I went out to Arizona and I was able to get the, uh, here's the drake and the hen together. And there's the drake. 
and then a ring neck. I'm going to show you two setups. Now on the ring neck, uh, all of these other ones I was shot from the shore. The ring neck I was in the water. This, this duck, I had some camo thrown over me. Uh, Max asks, what is the max depth? I try to go along the shoreline, Max. I'm not, or no, that's, um, that's not Max. Uh, G2 is Ray Ray. So Ray, I, I set up on along the shoreline, so I'm sitting down, and it's probably like three feet. So I want to get in as deep as I can without the water going into my waders. Uh, the other way to do it is just to back up against like a log, so you're a little bit blended in. And then again, I have like a camo throw over me in the lens. This duck swam within minimum focus. So this is barely cropped. He came all the way into the camera. And I don't know if the shutter was attracting him. Normally it makes him turn away, but he actually swam right to me. Uh, and then when we talk about the light, overcast, you won't see this. Uh, but when these ring necks extend their neck like that, that that's why they're called ring necks. You could see this brown uh, right along the base of their neck there. Uh, and again, it's kind of nice when you can get the drake and the hen in the same photo. So in the water for that one. There's a gad wall little drops we'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the show common merganser i actually had a better one i took last week but i included this because i wanted to show again these look like they have dark heads in overcast light but in uh, golden hour or in direct light you'll see the tones coming in in this case it's green and then uh, down in aruba a few years ago i had these uh, white cheeked pintails we talk about golden hour i could tell you the closer you get to the equator and, and aruba is getting down there uh, it's about five minutes. So in, in this time of year, this was October, I think I calculated like 15 or 20 minutes a golden hour. And then this one here, I'm going to finish with this one. This is again, that white cheeked pintail from Aruba. This was in the first few minutes of day. Uh, the light gets really strong down there really fast, but I want to show you the difference now, cause I'm going to switch from this golden hour light to, um, overcast light. Don't think that you can't shoot ducks in overcast. You're going to lose some, some quality. So on iridescent ducks, you're going to lose that. But let me show you the difference between this white cheek pintail here and here. I actually like both of these images a lot. Um, you'll see the eye on this one. Uh, if you can, I don't know if you can tell, but it's got a real nice quality to it. You're going to lose a little bit of that with overcast light, but it's still there. But the overall mood just changes and it feels very soft. It's a much cooler tone. Um, and I like this. So this is, uh, I'm going to show you a few images in overcast that worked for me. With this one, it was overcast, but I decided to go a little more high key. Um, I think it works, but you could see it just, it, it looks like it's floating on a cloud here. And in golden hour, you would have had totally different tones. This, these whites would have not um, shown the same way. Here's a common loon. I have a, a few loons at the end. You'll see a big difference in, in this from golden hour to overcast, but again, it worked. This is real soft overcast light, kind of an action shot uh, in terms of these water droplets coming off. And then another one, this is a horned grebe. Overcast light. And you can see the, like the, the backgrounds get real chocolatey and smooth. Uh, light changes everything, but don't be afraid to shoot it. Now here's mixed light. So this is a, I have a couple combinations where there was, this was not at golden hour. So this was a little bit above. I will tell you, I wouldn't shoot. I don't think I would shoot any bird between the hours of 10 and three in, uh, in spring, unless it was overcast. The sun is out here, but it's still low on the horizon and there's shade. So this is a park where there's some shaded areas. And so you could see darker areas behind the duck and some lighter areas in front, but it kind of creates a mood. I think I've got a couple. Here's a, a hooded merganser, very similar. This was in direct light. And you lose a little bit of the golden tones in there. But it's still not strong and overcast. If it were strong and overhead, when that light gets above them for any subject, no matter what it is, the shadows become too harsh and you lose any quality in the light. So even if you miss the first hour, I'm just trying to show you a couple of things that you can do. Um, in more direct light. This one is exposed for the breast of the merganser. So basically just trying to expose for the, the brightest part of the bird. And then everything else gets real dark. And then this was a dark background. I burned it down even more to make it more dramatic. So um, I really like that one. I think it gives a dramatic look. Um, silent mode. Somebody asked a question if I use silent mode. 
I will tell you the silent modes that I've heard do not sound very silent. So the only way to truly get a silent mode would be to go to a live view. And I have done that. The D500 and, and several of the new Nikons have a tilt. So you can uh, put the body down and instead of using that right angle, you could go to a live view and use the tilt so that you, the camera's below you. Um, and then you get no shutter at all. It, the autofocus at least, and I hate to bash Nikon because I love them, but the autofocus I've had zero success with. I've gotten a couple pictures with it, but I miss way more than I hit. So I don't think it's really intended to be used for um, a lot of movement. And uh, if anybody's a tech geek and they want to throw some comments in about the, the impacts of live view on autofocus, but it, it certainly does not focus um, the way the camera is designed to. All right, Max, thank you. All right, now this is, I'm going to show you uh, compare and contrast here. This is in uh, direct light. It's not overhead, but it's strong light. Uh, let me just show you the difference in the quality in these two images. Now, I, I don't mind this. It's a different look, but you can see this background's real hot and you can see the water's real hot and there's not a lot of uh, like tone to the light. So it's, it's kind of flat. I, I do like this, so I'm not bashing it, but look at the difference. It's the same species. It might even have been the same. Now, it was a different time. This is a golden hour shot, same species, same location, different time of year, uh, and that's in more direct light. So just big difference in the quality of light. And again, you might like the other one. You might like this first one better, uh, if that's your personal preference. But these tones um, kind of bring it out for me. The second part of the, the waterfowl conversation I wanted to have does involve perspective. I use this as a first example for perspective because at an ultra low perspective, and most of the images you see, everything I show you today is gonna to be at eye level. So I don't shoot ducks above the water. I'll show you a couple examples of why I don't. There, you can do it. You can be a foot above the water and still get some nice effects. When you start getting higher than a foot or two, uh, to me, the angle is just so unflattering. You lose the engagement with the subject and you start to show nothing but water. So in this example, I'm so low that what I'm showing as a background is not water anymore. It's the far shoreline. And that far shoreline consists of reeds, um, some green and some yellow reeds. They're being lit up by the morning sun. So you get this really nice patterned background. It's not one of those smooth, clean, sterile backgrounds. Um, I've gotten away from those types of backgrounds and these are the types of backgrounds I like to include. So we'll go through some uh, examples of perspective. Now this one's a good example where the background isn't really coming into play. You can see it's a broken background. So that means the water ended and that's the far shoreline. This bird is so close to me that everything is blurred out. I love how he looks like he's kind of floating on clouds. This is an overcast uh, scene, but the engagement now comes just from that focus on the eye. So everything draws you right to his eye. And really the subject is less about the total bird and that's why I cropped the body out. Um, this was originally a horizontal composition and I basically just cropped it vertically. I was able to keep the whole top and bottom so it's still a fairly large image but I love that eye. And these low perspectives gives you that level of engagement that you lose when you go to a higher perspective. Another good example, again, you can see the background changing here as it goes from the water to the far shoreline. When the subject is this close, you'll get absolutely no detail in the background. But again, the engagement here is just around the eye. They call this a, a common golden eye, and you can obviously tell why. Uh, it's the first time I had photographed them. I got them twice this year in two different locations, but this was by far the closest look. And then again, a wood duck now, the engagement being close, being on that same level. I think you lose a lot of that when you go to a higher perspective. This one, it almost looks like he's talking to you. Now, this is not a good picture, so this is mine. I, I tried to find some compare and contrast images. Let me just take a break and see if there's any questions. Uh, yep, same experience with 850. Uh, Cam Heard, all right, man. Uh, all the comments seem to reiterate what I said about the live view. So um, I tried to go back and see if I could find an old picture of a species that I had recently taken and show you a difference in um, perspective and what that does. So this one actually encompasses all three elements the wrong way. I've got uh, poor light. I've got a poor perspective. And again, look at how the perspective just includes nothing but water. So I've also got poor environment. Now, 
this perspective can work if you've got something of interest in the water, whether it's other ducks or the water itself has some kind of magnificent color or reflection that you want to include in the composition. In this case, it's just bad. The water looks bad. The duck looks bad. The perspective is bad. So I had to go back to 2014 <laughs> because that's when I first started to do um, more serious photography or at the time think I was more serious. And this is what I got last week. Same species, world of difference. Perspective is dead on. And what you're seeing in the top now, that break is the far shoreline that's getting hit. This one was at night. So this was uh, about an hour before sunset. And uh, I was able to isolate this buffle head. You could see the iridescent showing from the direct light. The low light, if it was above it, again, uh, it higher, harsher light looks like this. Lower, starting to get into golden hour, it changes the quality and it starts to look like this. So how do you get down to a buffle head? It's the same technique that I use for almost all waterfowl. There's two ways to do it. One is to set up early or study behavior and wait. Uh, before I got this buffle head, I was working a cove of mergansers. So the mergansers were in the cove. I went down to the water and I set up so that they didn't hear me go down. They didn't see me go down. And then I kind of waited and prayed that they would come around the corner right in front of me. Some of the shots in here, that's the way it happened. Now, buffle heads are diving ducks. So I got really lucky that this one was isolated. He was, he was completely alone. If there were other hens or drakes near this duck, it makes it a lot more challenging. When there's only one, you can do what I call dive and dash. So the duck goes under, you go, you count. You, I was so patient with this one because I've screwed him up 10 times this year. I, I waited about five minutes and watched his behavior and I counted how long he went under each time. And it was 20 seconds almost every time. So I knew I had a 20 second buffer, but I didn't push it. So... I counted to 10, I would run for 10, 10 seconds, and then I would jump on the ground. And then I would lay there until he couldn't see me, and then I would wait again, repeat the cycle until I made it all the way to the shoreline. The cool thing is when I got down to the shoreline and I put my camera on the ground, I had a nice spot, he was still underwater, and it was literally like I was doing a victory dance in my head because I absolutely knew I had him. Once I set up in that spot, I knew he was mine. Once you're low and on the shoreline and the duck is by itself and there's nothing else to distract it, there's a good chance you're going to get him into a routine. I stayed with this duck for about 90 minutes in one spot. By the time I left, he was so comfortable with my presence. I literally stood up and walked to my car and he just looked at me and continued about his business. So I was there for so long, I had become part of the environment. And if you've ever been around a wild buffle head, or any duck really, but that just doesn't happen until you become part of the environment. So again, the big challenge um, in these cases sometimes is to become part of the environment. Uh, this is the same buffle head. And what I wanted to do now is transition. So I, I, everything has, has shown that low perspective and I've shown you a couple different types of light. I do wanna show a couple different ways to present ducks. So I'm gonna go a little bit smaller in frame now. So not everything has to fill the frame. In order to go smaller in frame, the environment becomes more and more important. So in this case, I don't have a whole lot going on, but I have some nice textures and colors in this background. So to me, I can contrast this really colorful duck against this plain but patterned background. And I'll show you a couple more um, that are similar. So again, a little smaller in frame, not tiny in frame, but definitely smaller. If the background was solid, I don't think I... I don't think I'd like this picture as much, but I like those golden tones and there's a lot of color in the background. And again, that's from some dead vegetation on the far shoreline, just a little bit of sun catching it. And then this is a nice fall scene. So this is a ruddy duck. Ruddy ducks in fall are pretty bland looking. It's the only ruddy duck photograph I actually have that I've ever posted. So uh, I did want to show it as a small in frame, but you can see the colors in the background. So you get a sense of season and you get a sense of place. So as we go smaller in frame with the subject, we tend to want to um, exploit the background. And then here's the, the last buffle head I got, uh, which was last, it was two years ago almost. But I like these patterned out of focus um, trees. This is a lake that was completely dry uh, probably five years ago. Uh, there were trees that it reflooded, and it was some, just some really interesting growth going on. 
and it reflooded into an area where there were trees growing. So uh, I liked this image, even though the buffle head isn't showcased, the overall image is, is still pleasing and there's a lot of patterns and textures. So in some cases we blurred out backgrounds and made them disappear. And in this case, we like we have this nice pattern in these, these shapes in the background. Um, one thing I'll tell you is that the duck here is further away and I'm not gonna go into uh, background blurring, but anytime the subject is further away from you, the background is gonna get more and more in focus. So the subject gets closer to you, uh, the backgrounds are just gonna blur out and that's just the way the lens focuses. It's focusing closer so that what's ever further away is out there. Let me run through the questions real quick. Um, do you have luck with windy, wavy environments? So this lake that I'm shooting on here gets ripples and waves. Uh, the rougher the waves, the tougher it can be. Let me show you, uh, I wanna try to get one that might show. So this bird, has swells and one thing you'll get uh, when there is choppy water is you can take advantage of it sometimes and get neat action on the water. Uh, my preference would be smooth water. Uh, you can see how smooth this water is. It's like glass and you'll get really nice reflections off glass. And then the same thing here, this was choppy water. So this foreground blur is like a wave or ripple that's in front of them. And I'm not sure how many more I'll have like that. But yeah, you'll see a big difference in the smooth water and the reflections and the choppy water. With fall colors, definitely look for those really nice uh, calm days where you can get those backgrounds. So if you look at, uh, I'll go back one more. If you look at this, look how calm the water is there. And that's all those colors get reflected. If that, a uh, great point, because when that water's choppy, you're gonna lose a lot of that color and a lot of that reflection. Um, should I give up on the shot if I can't get low enough? Not necessarily. I'll show you some examples later. Uh, did my first dive and dash. All right. It is really cool when it works, Seth. So that's great. Um, counting seconds. Yes, definitely. Haley, give it a shot. And uh, how do you alter shutter speed for various waterfowl? 90% of the time I'll shoot wide open. So whatever your lens is capable of. Uh, the shutter speed, as long as you're over one five hundredth for anything that's not moving or preening so i tend to go with a lower iso and a lower shutter speed if i'm just doing these portraits where they're floating around if i start to notice them preening or i think they're going to get flighty like if somebody's walking down a path towards them then i'll sacrifice iso and i'll try to get up to at least one one thousandth but probably if i think it's flight one two thousandth of a second um, preening anywhere from a thousandth to a two thousandth will normally get it done. When they're preening, they're not doing a ton. If if you want to get the drying off shots, and I'll show you one of those later, those are going to come at uh, like one two thousandth of a second. You'll actually freeze the water and get some water droplets. So good questions. Um, I'll get to that, Ryan. I see your question about how do you not blow out the uh, the whites. So I'll get to that too. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit to environment or, or st kind of staying on environment, but not necessarily small in frame with the environment, but just how you can use different conditions. This was a like really, really foggy day. There was a lot of mist on the water. I salvaged this. I, I couldn't print this big because there's not a lot of detail. Uh, the original image was was very flat. So I did add a lot of contrast back into this one. Uh, but I just like the scene and I wanted to show it to you guys just to show you something that's a little bit different. Uh, but it's a misty water and then you've got these really uh, high contrast ducks. And I, I always love taking a background and, and a subject that's different. So in this case, high contrast with the hooded merganser on a completely white background that's got a real soft feel to it. Um, again, including environment. This is a loon that we shot last year. I shot this with Ray but you could see the mist coming off the water right at sunrise. This was one of the most beautiful mornings I can remember. I mean, like of my life can remember. It was just stunning. Uh, we were up there for a couple days and we got really, really lucky with the conditions and, and this one turned out really nice. I love that one. Uh, this is just, these are just Canada geese. I shot this with Mark Stroll. Um, I warmed this up quite a bit. Originally it was a little more on the white side, but, uh, after I warmed it up and, and kind of accentuated that, that first hour of the day, 
I liked this one. Um, so we kind of silhouetted these, these geese so you see the shape. And then there's a bunch of little goslings down here at the bottom. And environment, conditions. So rain, snow, those are the type of things that add interest. We got uh, a series of wood ducks last year. Ray and I went down and uh, we got really lucky. So we, we were kind of hoping it would snow or at least get some flurries. And we had probably 15, 20 minutes of pretty good snow. And in that, these wood ducks, who are, which are real cooperative uh, at this one area, we were able to get a bunch of snow shots. So this is a, a way to add interest. Don't give up if it's raining out. It, it does make it a lot tougher, but you can get some interesting things in the rain as well. But snow is a, is a pretty neat thing to shoot. And here's a way to include the environment. I entered this into a couple competitions in a in a, like an urban category. Um, I thought it might do well because it's it's like to me it's a hooded merganser that tells a story. It's like looking at this graffiti. I could almost hear him saying like, "What's going on here?" Um, while Marvin Gaye plays in the background for some reason, but it's just a cool scene. And again, it without it, it's a nice image, but it doesn't tell a story. You start adding that last element, so light and perspective are, are always going to give you good pictures. You start adding that other element of the environment or action, and it really does uh, change things. This is a wide angle shot of a loon. And then here's that same buffle head I was working with last week. So after we talk about the environment, there's really no environment going on here, but they're starting to, to show action, which adds interest. I was able to capture the, the head of this guy just as he was breaking the water. And it's kind of neat, he's got this indentation of water around him uh, like a vacuum that's kind of sucking the water down as he's about to make another dive and he just did this over and over in front of me I kept trying to capture it and I was able to get one with his eye open where the head wasn't under the water yet so it worked out well and again just that really nice in this case it's a it's a smooth even colored background but it's contrasted by this bird which is uh, got all that iridescent and a lot of white on it how to not blow out one I chimp a lot so when I got a, a duck that's white and black you can in, in direct light there's no way to do it that you just can't there's no way to expose the white and the black in direct strong light if you're in a shaded area you'll have better luck and if you've got really low golden hour light you can definitely make it work um, but again I'll chimp a lot I'll use spot metering and I'll try to get that white but once I find out the settings that work I'll try to lock in those settings so I'm not using auto ISO anymore. I'll just lock in the ISO and try to keep it there. So I do kind of chimp off the back of the camera for a while until I'm comfortable that I'm not going to blow out the whites. Uh, if you have to sacrifice whites or blacks, most people will tell you to expose for the whitest uh, and don't blow out the whites. And you can normally recover some of the detail in the black, but when you blow out the whites, there's nothing you can do and a lot of times it doesn't look good. So. All right, um, a couple more like interactive type shots, not just the water here, but there's a chick on the back. Always nice when you can get interaction with either male or female, or in this case, uh, a parent and chick. Water is a great effect. This is a common merganser on a really dark overcast day. Uh, I can't imagine what my ISO, let me check real quick, 1600. And this was at 1 3 20th of a second, so really pretty slow shutter speed for, um, for waterfowl. Again, I like to try to be up above 500th, and you can see that water just dripping off his bill. I wish that I had either a better camera that could have handled the noise, um, or I could have gotten a little closer because I had to crop this quite a bit so that you could get the detail. Unfortunately, I don't think I have enough to print this, but if this was a closer image with that dark background, the bright red, the iridescent, and that water dripping, if I could have cropped that really tight, I think it would have been a, a really stunning image. As it is, I like it, but um, I really think that one could have been special. And then after preening and diving, eventually they have to get rid of water. So study the behavior and kind of look for patterns. Um, some of them will shake off right after they're done preening and for others they'll do it after diving. Uh, in this case I watched the pied billed grebe here. This was out in Utah. Got real close looks at them and uh, had, had a lot of shots of them on the water. But I waited to try to get something like this 
to give you an idea of what that one was, let me just peek down at the shutter speed. I was only down at like 1 640th of a second. Normally I would be a little bit faster than that, but you could see that the water um, is still in pretty good shape. There's motion in the water, but the head's sharp. So I'm kind of actually a little surprised. Um, I normally would go a little bit up above 1 1,000th for that. And if I could get, if I had enough light for 1 2,000th, I would have gone with that. Uh, F4, yeah, 110 ISO. So I'm guessing on that one, he's, he might have surprised me because I was probably on auto ISO to get that, that ISO so low. And uh, he might have come up quick and I might have been going after portraits on that one. So sometimes you get lucky, but that one ideally would have been more like one two thousandth of a second with the ISO pushed up over 400 or 640. And then we talked about like drying off. Here's another one. Uh, I, lo I love the way that the water on this isn't all over the place. So you get a really nice portrait. The wings are back and then the water is just like trailing off the wings instead of flying all over the place like the grebe. So the grebe here, water's flying all over. And then on this one, it's just rolling off the, uh, the wings at the back. I'm going to go through my three favorites. So these are my top three duck pictures. And then I'm going to show you a couple from Ray. I have absolutely no idea how much time I'm going to be on tonight because we got so screwed up in the beginning of this. Um, so if it goes a little over an hour, just bear with or just cut out and, uh, and watch the replay. My top three pictures. I love this wood duck. I love this uh, leathery background. The reason, if this was just the portrait, I, I probably would still like it. The light's just gorgeous. What I love about this is that the hen is in the background and it's barely visible. So you get the pair, the focus is on the male, real showy, which the wood ducks are, but then the female's just in the background, real quiet. And uh, I just, I, I kind of love the way that, that contrast is with that leathery background and the real bright iridescence of the wood duck. Uh, this is a picture that I've had some success with really red backgrounds in autumn and then you got that monochromatic hood of the the signature hooded work uh merganser and then this is the last one of my set and again interaction with the chick and the and the parent here the loon riding on the back and that's from new hampshire last year golden hour really got lucky with that one it's uh one of my favorites all right let me pop over i'm going to show you a couple other images uh before i bring Oh, and God help us all. We've got, if we, if Skype works, <laughs> I'll have Brad James on with me tonight. Uh, he's going to be our, our special guest. We're going to go through 10 or 15 images of his and uh, fingers crossed if this works. Keep the comments going. If you can hear Brad and the levels are right, we didn't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> yes, definitely fingers crossed. We didn't have a whole lot of time to prep this, but uh, I think, I think it's going to work. Uh, Ray Hennessy uh, sent me some pictures. So, uh, I put together a folder and I want to walk you through one of the things I love about Ray is he I don't think anybody uses light uh, more creatively than Ray with with any type of bird photography and I don't think anybody does small and frame better with with the environment now this one I wouldn't consider necessarily small and frame but it does a great job at incorporating environment and I didn't have a bluing teal on my set so uh, bluing teal on some really nice background, really great colors, a little bit smaller in frame, so you don't have to show these ducks huge to see all of that detail and all the colors. Now we go small in frame. Um, with a different species, it may not work as well, but that hooded merganser, it's so signature that if you know waterfowl, you instantly identify what it is, and then you've got that huge scale. Um, so you, it, it really gives you a sense of, of what a morning is like, that you're walking up to the water's edge and you feel like you're there. I uh, love that one. Another one that's a little bit smaller in frame. Here's a wood duck highlighting autumn colors. So great usage of color. So again, as the color and the environment becomes more, we don't need the subject as much. I'll tell you, if, you, if you're entering uh, photos into a contest or doing prints for your walls, what's popular sometimes on social media are these you know, wingtip to wingtip crops, these really hard, um, tight pictures of, of songbirds or warblers. I do a lot of that. I like to show detail. Uh, I'm a lot of a birder, not just a photographer. So I like to show the detail of the species. And I certainly want to mix in so I don't, so, the, so not everything looks the same. But what shows well on social media doesn't normally translate to what hangs well on a wall or what wins a contest. 
images like these tend to do much better. You think about what's getting judged out there and you've got 99 pictures of tight portraits and then something like this pops up and you stop and you look and you study it and you say, wow, that's different and it's beautiful and I could picture that large on a wall somewhere. Uh, really nice job with that one. Ray does a lot with backlight. Uh, probably nobody shoots more backlit birds than Ray. So when you do that, you'll get these specular highlights in the foreground, not just in the background. Uh, really neat effect. And here's another one. You can see there's no D. You don't even see the eye on this bird. But again, it's not just about the bird. It's about the scene. There's a balance of negative space at the top. And then again, the, the specular highlights at the bottom. And then talk about negative space. This is just, to me, this is stunning. And again, you're looking at, you know, 100 pictures of ducks. And then something like this pops up and it's different and it's beautiful. The light is perfect. Um, there is no environment, but it works. And you've got that great reflection at the bottom. Another one of those overcast, uh, I showed you one of mine, but this is what overcast light will often do. You can kind of go with a high key type look. And then we talk about color and environment. And it's all about it here. Talk about action here. And then we'll finish with this one, which is just so different. Um, a hooded merganser. And the subject really becomes the back, this rim light on the hood. So you can identify the species. Anytime I do like a silhouette, to me it's important to show the shape and to be able to identify what that species is. Uh, if you know ducks, as soon as you look at this, you know it's a common, you know it's a merganser. You don't know if it's a hooded merganser, I guess, but um, I can tell that that's a. I'm guessing it's a hooded mercanser hen and uh, just gorgeous the way that light is. And then that light is mirrored all through the water. So really great stuff. All right, I'm going to take a, a quick break. I'm going to look at questions. As I do, I'm going to ask uh, Brad just to unmute your mic and just say hi and we'll see if the team can hear you. Hello, everybody. All right. And then if the team can hear that, let me know. And I'll pull up your... Um, I'm going to pull up your portfolio here, Brad. I'll let people see the big overview of what we got going on. Uh, I'll answer a couple questions here. Uh, just real quick, could ev okay, good, thank you. A uh, couple questions. Thank you for the compliments on the loons. What the lo the longest I've waited for a target bird? Uh, the longest I've waited for a duck was probably. But well, keep in mind, I'm dealing with light. So normally I'll set up an hour before I want to get the birds. And if it's in the afternoon, um, so if, let's say sunsets at five, I get there at three. I'm hoping to shoot from four to five. So two hours is about the longest I will wait. I've done that a, a couple times this year, unfortunately, where I, I waited probably 90 minutes once in waders, uh, just sitting in cold water and nothing came in front of me. So uh, yeah, that wasn't fun. But I, I really don't mind. I'm pretty good up to about like 45 minutes of waiting with nothing happening. And then, then I do get pretty restless. All right. Okay. So uh, I think we got all the questions. We've got, we must have a birder out there, Seth. Uh, it could be a red-breasted murder cancer. All right. All right. So let me jump over to Brad. Brad, before I'm going to show the portfolio uh, with all your pictures. Um, sure. Yeah. As you could just give us a brief introduction, I do want to say a couple things. Uh, I've known Brad on Instagram for a while. I've loved his work with waterfowl. He does a really nice job with portraiture, especially. Um, I I haven't had anybody with a with a funny accent on in a while. Uh, last time was Georgina <laughs> from Australia, so I brought a Canadian on today. Eh? and uh, and a new and a, and a newfie at that. Yeah, and a newfie. So uh, all yeah. right. introduce yourself, Brad. Hi, yeah, like Scott said, my name is uh, Brad James. I'm in living in Newfoundland, Canada, on the east coast of Canada, uh, in a small town, Conception Bay South. Um, been doing photography for probably 10 years, I guess. Uh, wildlife more seriously over the past, say, four to five years. Um, I have, unfortunately, a good government job, so this photography is not my full-time job but it is my obsession, so, yeah. Okay, and uh, what we'll do is, I, I asked Brad to give me about 15 images, so he provided kind of a variety. Uh, I'm gonna start here with your long-tailed duck. I'm gonna show that to everybody, and you can tell us a little bit about this one. 
Yeah, so actually this is a species I didn't imagine I would ever get a, a, a close-up of because here in Newfoundland, generally our long-tailed ducks uh, in the wintertime, they spend most of the time uh, out in the ocean, so out along the coastlines, and, I mean, you're looking at them, uh, you know, a kilometer away. Um, but uh, on one occasion, I think it was just ending a session, actually, um, at another location, and I was on my way home and uh, decided to stop by a little estuary that's uh, about a five-minute drive from my house and noticed this, I guess, larger duck and, and with a different patterns um, dive. So I thought that was strange. So I waited a little bit and I took it with the binoculars. When I looked, couldn't believe it. It was a long-tailed duck. So I kind of did that uh, dash and uh, dive and dash, as Scott would call it, um, and actually did the same type of thing, timed it. So I, and I generally do that with divers. I'll, uh, I'll watch their behavior, watch when they dive, kind of count a few seconds. Um, but surprisingly, I was able to get down to shore and this long-tailed duck seemed to be pretty curious with the, uh, with the shutter going off. So uh, I was actually able to spend, I think it was close to an hour nice. with her. She kept going back and forth. And like I said, coming so close, I couldn't even focus on her. So it was, uh, it was quite an experience. Yeah, and I love how, how soft the water is down here. Um, yeah, it was really nice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, one of the things I'll say is is um, I think we edit very similar. Like I could see myself editing yeah. this picture almost exactly yeah. like you have it here. <laughs> the next one up yeah. looks like a tufted duck. It's uh, It is. That's yep. a female, yeah. Okay. Female tufted. So, and the reason I added this one in is, is kind of go back to you were talking about like overcast light. I generally, when I, if it's an overcast day and it's, you know, a day that I'm heading out, I generally try to hit locations that have like high foliage, large trees or whatever around that area that I'm hoping to photograph a duck in. So then the reflection in the water, if it's a calm day, is generally going to, you know, it's going to look nice because, um, you know, you know, if you go down an overcast day, if the water's either a bit choppy, you're getting, you know, that gray tones and mm -hmm. that silvers. But if, if you've got a lot of foliage around that pond, around that lake, uh, and then the duck is in that area, you'll generally get some really nice colors. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I added this Beautiful. one in. All right, that next one up, uh, is this a tufted again, <laughs> displaying? No, or is that, that a ring, is that's actually, a ringneck, I see it. Yep. Yeah, the male ringneck. So here here in Newfoundland, we get, um, especially on the east coast of Newfoundland, we may get one or two of uh, of this species show up during the winter, or during the whole year for that matter. Um so luckily, uh, I think this was back, this was a while ago, 2014 or something, I think. Um, there was a male and a female that showed up at a lake uh, in town. And uh, so I was there laying down on the lake for, oh, I, I guess, an hour or more watching them. And uh, at one point, I noticed he started trying to court her. So luckily, he came right in frame. I just released the trigger, and when I looked in, I was, I was surprised to see yeah. it. Yeah, a lot of people, when they look at it, are like, what is going on? <laughs> it's an odd uh, odd pose for sure. And I don't have the settings for this, Brad, but I would assume when you saw the courting behavior, you might have, or, yeah, or maybe the shutter was a little higher. Yeah, for sure. Usually, yeah. I'll get off to around 1,600, 2,000. Yeah, so okay. Uh, Yep, real similar. Now I've got another one. This looks like a, a greater, well, you've got it listed as a greater scalp. I can't tell the it difference. Is, it is a greater scalp, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, a little so, bit about this one. The water's beautiful. Yeah, so basically I, this, I noticed this last year. So again, this is at the, the same lake as the, the ringneck duck. So during a, a short window of time uh, in December, um, this is in an urban location, um, I started noticing that just shortly after sunrise, there was a ridge behind me, the light would actually strike a house that's on the hill on the other side, and then for about 15 minutes, it would shot, reflect this light back in the water. So I, this year, um, I started kind of timing myself and lining myself up in this one spot, and as the divers would pass back and forth through it, I would try to get... Uh, to uh, capture one of them. I think one of the most difficult part about this shot and and the next one, um, Scott, is uh, 
trying to keep the, the camera focused or trying to have it lock onto the subject because, you know, it's, it's a bit deceiving when you look at this, the way it's processed, but just as that duck glides into this light, it's almost like shining or, uh, sorry, pointing your, your lens into the sun. Yep. Uh, so I can't imagine how many pictures I have that are all out of focus, <laughs> Uh, you know, because as soon as the duck would just get in that perfect light, sure yeah. shot, it would start searching and focusing. So, like this one, this is a uh, this is actually a tufted. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy just sat in it, and it just worked out perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I was able to uh, to really frame him up and get it nice and sharp. And actually, if you look at it close, his face um, is full of ice too. Uh, you can see all the droplets are frozen on his face. Wow. Yeah, and what a look! Like he, he just looks. Yeah, he's off. not happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I think a couple of things I wanted to point out. Uh, one is you, you heard Brad talk about like seeing things and planning around it. Uh, that that's really a, a key attribute I think to a lot of good photographers is they see something and they start to visualize what could be. Uh, if if Brad is like me, and I think he is everything he sees all day long probably involves like, what if a bird was there? Or what if that was happening? Or what if I had my camera with me right now? Exactly. I will also point out that you'll see Brad is at a little bit higher elevation for this and it really works. I'll go back to the other picture. You don't see the far shoreline like you had in some of the super low, but in this case, the image is about the water and it really works. Uh, I don't know how high you are off the water, Brad. I'm guessing about a foot. Yeah, it's not high, and it's only those small adjustments too. Yep. It doesn't take much, and and with the other one or the one you were just looking at, the uh, the greater uh, Scott. Mm-hmm. Also, in that location, the lake is the majority of the lake is frozen, so I kind of wanted that little bit higher as well, so that I yep. would eliminate the white at the top of the gotcha. top of the scene, right? Yeah, and when you've yeah. got ice on lakes, which is very common. Uh, also know that it, it can be to your benefit. So when lakes start to partially freeze, it congregates ducks in the open water. So that can be very beneficial when you're planning a trip or where to go is knowing what's frozen, what's not, and where the open water is. Sometimes entire flocks, I, I've got a snow geese behind my house. I don't know if anybody's ever seen like my Instagram story, but in the mornings I have 10,000 snow geese that fly out. Well, that depends on the other quarries in the area what's available, what's frozen, where are the eagles hunting. And so those things will move. The ducks will do the same as, um, as areas freeze locally. We've got a couple lakes in small ponds that never freeze because they've got water circulating. And that's where the ducks tend to congregate. Uh, I'm yeah. looking at a wood duck on some gorgeous gold. It, uh, just before we jump to that, I just want to add, and, and like one thing here too as well, like when our divers who are tufted or, or greater scops, when they show up generally at the beginning of fall, they're way more skittish. It's much harder to get them. You know, you have to use coverage and, you know, sometimes a blind or, you know, you, you t- tend to have to, to spend a lot more time. As we get further into, into the winter time, they're forced into these smaller openings either in a lake or a pond or, or whatever the case may be so then they just become more habituated to humans they're a lot less tame it provides a different opportunity um, and in like those cases i could use this unique light with now a species that you know is in a smaller area that i can kind of work right yeah okay let's get on to this golden wood yep. duck yeah so again this is another species um that is uh, rare. Um, we don't normally get them. We may get one or two throughout the year. Um, this particular male was uh, kind of hiding out in uh, in a park, but in a small stream. Um, on my first visit, uh, the light wasn't great, but what I did notice is at the far end of the stream, uh, I think it was a birch tree, I'm not sure, but um, I mean, it just was full of golden leaves. Um, beautiful color. So, Behind me again was a ridge, um, and I love this type of light where basically the sun is just coming up, and it's lighting um, this the foliage in the background, spitting the color across um, the water, and this duck is basically in shade. Um, so then you're able to, to expose for those golden colors, uh, and not blow those out in trying to kind of keep a relative exposure on him as well. Um, so this was, again, it was all part of this this plan, right? Um, yeah, so. Yeah. I was going to ask you if it was backlit, because you could see that the front of the bird is shadow. Yeah. 
So I thought maybe the yeah. sun was going down behind. I was actually going to say you don't always have to shoot with the sun at your back. Uh, Ray, I uh, showed a bunch of examples earlier where Ray shoots into the sun. Um, but yeah. yeah, great call. Uh, when the bird is in shadow or shade and there's light sources yeah. around it, it, it can really work. That's that's beautiful. All right, now it, it looks does, like gonna... yeah. And it's... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to show. No, I was going to say it's, it's it's a type of light that I've been you know really working in the past year so i've done some shorebirds as well i'm just loving this like the, the bird in shade and then when this overhead light behind you just strikes you know nice uh fall foliage and reflects in the water it works so well yeah now i've got two green wing teals um both preening no Same. one's a green wing teal hold and on, the other on, is notice. actually a male pintail uh, it he, is yes you fooled me i he flipped too quick yep. <laughs> okay uh so we so, have the green wing. so two great examples of the preening behavior that we talked about great backgrounds too on both yeah so this is a, a i guess a newer location that i've uh, started photographing in and i actually was using it more for shorebirds at the time uh it's a lake um but there was a lot of shorebirds showing up but what i loved about this area is that i literally can just lay right on the shoreline my camera's inches off the water uh um so basically at the time i was i was photographing some uh, greater yellow legs and because i had been there and i mean when i go to a location i generally show up before sunrise and i'm laying down in one spot i'm not moving i will generally stay there for a few hours i don't move at all and uh out of nowhere this female uh, green wing teal came out and decided to approach and kind of got up into this more shallow area and just started preening and what i love about this that anyone has ever photographed uh, the female green wing teal especially is you rarely get to see that little green patch and might get little hints of it mm -hmm. so especially when a duck is preening that's when I love to focus in on that one particular duck because, you know, you're getting different uh, feather uh, patterns or, or different shapes, and then you're actually, you know, really getting to see those beautiful colors that could be hidden when they're just, you know, gliding around the water, right? Yeah, and this is, I, I will tell you, Brad, I'm, I pulled up the, the pintail. Uh, yeah. This is my favorite picture. So this, this image, I saw it uh, when you posted it, and I, like, literally fell in love we have a hub that we we on our hub uh it's called wildlife inspired we really look for images that are creative different artistic we don't do a lot of portraits on that hub i think i featured this the day i saw it like i just absolutely fell in love with this thanks appreciate it yeah so it's similar situation again um this was actually i think in around uh when hunting season opened up so at the lake that I was at, um, we were just getting streams of different birds coming in. You could tell they were kind of, uh, you know, trying to find a safer location, I guess, unfortunately. And when this uh, duck uh, first came in, I actually thought it was the female because uh, it looked very similar. And until it started to actually uh, start preening and revealing that the, the green uh, strip, then I realized it was actually uh, the male. Uh, I guess it's in eclipse. Uh, mm -hmm. so but yeah again nice calm water and again it's an overcast day but that's yep. you know why i love that location because you've got you know large amounts of foliage high foliage in around it's going to give you that beautiful reflection if if there's uh there's no wind right yeah and overcast so. a lot of people think they need light and uh i i you know whenever i talk to somebody don't be afraid to shoot in different conditions the only one to avoid is when the sun is overhead that's the only one that i've I can't think of an image uh, for waterfowl that I've ever seen with direct light. I mean, maybe there's something you could do crazy and artistic and just expose a part of the white and make everything else black, but it's really, really, really stretching it. But images like this in soft light, they work every time. Exactly. And then you've got great color on this northern shoveler. Yeah, again, it's it's another uh, uncommon species here. Um, it was actually a friend of mine. Uh, it's just a small, uh, swampy area um, about... A five minute walk from his house so we generally stop by there just to kind of check things out um there are some uh like american widgeon eurasian widgeon that tend to pop by there so we were kind of just going to see if they were there um and out of nowhere this guy just kind of started coming in through the reeds so we set up got low and uh luckily for us he just hung out for the for a nice while and i get 
you know, another thing, and I think I have another image of... Mm -hmm. uh, I got it up now. Uh, yeah, that one, yeah. Um, but I look, I love looking for complementary, and, and it's not always possible, but complementary colors in your background yeah. that match your subject. And, and in the next image as well, my pintail is very similar. Um, you know, I love when that kind of all ties together. Yeah, um, I got the pintail with, up now. Yeah, yeah. With the... Um, with the portrait as well, you know, that's uh, of the uh, Northern Shoveler. You know, I think that's why I love spending so much time with a particular subject or at a particular location. I'm the type of person, when I go out, I'm going to one location, and that's it for my day, generally. Um, because it's these little rare moments that, you know, like in that case, there was a feather that was just floating around the water. You know, fingers crossed, eyes crossed, everything. I was hoping he'd go up near it, and sure enough, he did. It stuck to its uh, bill, and there you go. you got a unique image. You I, know, I, I just need to say, it. Brad, yeah. we don't encourage the use of baiting on this show, so if you carried a bag of feathers with you and, talk, and tossed <laughs> no, them into no, the no. water. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. All right. But, yeah, no, like, you know, I, I – there's a lot of photographers that I see that, you know, will go to a location, grab a couple of shots, off to yep. the next location, yep. grab a few. You know, I think to capture those unique images, you, you have to spend time with the subject for it to get comfortable to, you know, it's not all just going to happen in five minutes. So Yeah. I'm going to scroll through the next three. I'm going to group these together. I've got a pintail. Uh, you oh talked about the complementary colors. The, the exactly. widgeon. Oh, my yep. God. On this yellow and gold. Yeah. Absolutely and gorgeous. Too, and that's the one that, you know, um, I, what I was going to say with that one is, you know, sometimes in a location, just because you have more, I guess, uh, tamer ducks, I guess, sometimes you can use that to your advantage as well. Because in this location, sometimes the American widgeon, you know, um, over time, they become a little bit more habituated to people, a little bit more, you know, used to seeing someone riding by on a bike or whatnot. And it sometimes, I've found in my experience, allows a more wild duck like this Eurasian to approach, to feel a little bit more calm. As he mm -hmm. sees the other ducks in around in an area, okay, it's safe to go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what happened in this case. Um, I had been there before sunrise again. Light is streaming in, hitting the foliage in the background. He's a little bit more in the shade um, and was able to get that uh, yeah. wider shot. So. I'm going to pass. Uh, you got a tufted yeah. duck up here. I want to get to these these two next yeah. ones after the tufted duck. So we talked about perspective and that not, you know, you can get creative with perspective. So we've got two overhead images. Uh, you've yeah. got a tufted duck. How did you get this? Like, where are you located for these yeah. two images? I'm going to leave so, the second one up. Sure. Yeah. So for the first one, just to kind of, I had this image in my head for a while, and it wasn't until I actually took my daughter to her first um, Christmas bird count, and we were in a park, and we were just all kind of stood there on the bridge, and I had thought about this image where I wanted to, you know, include a duck that was a bit wider, kind of looking down. I knew I wanted a male tufted, so sure enough, while we were waiting there, I seen this. Um, I've seen a few male tufted in this area, so I returned the next weekend, um, and what I want to do, I used the 70 to 200, I'm stood on a bridge, and they're passing back and forth underneath. Um, so I just basically framed them up wide. I think I might have been at 70. I don't know if it says it there, Scott. Yeah, it was either, any, obviously, anywhere no. from 70 to 200. No, I don't know why I think it's stripped all the time. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so for the wider shot, uh, like I said, it was 7,200, I think. Uh, luckily, got a little shape of a heart there uh, down in the, the left-hand yeah, corner. I see that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's strange. It was actually some reflections in water because there's three frames with that reflection. You could see it coming together, and it just created a heart. So nice. I can't – yeah, it worked out really cool. The next shot uh, – sorry, go back to the portrait one. Yep. Uh, S same same uh, same location, but what I decided to do there, I really want to put emphasis on that uh, that tuft on mm -hmm. their head, that unique uh, characteristic in those. So that was that framed up at 500, and uh, like I said, they were just passing under. Just as he would come, I would nail that shot looking down. And it really shows the iridensis in his head as well. So. And then we your last two. These are, I would say this is your signature. Like to me, this yeah. is this is this is you. Like if I think of Brad James, this is the picture. 
Yeah, and I like the tighter, you know, showing all those nice details. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess why I included these two, I guess more of my favorite at the end. So I've kind of got this soft spot for the American Widgeon. Um, you know, first saw them, I think, uh, back in 2010 for the first time. My friend showed me this location where they showed up. But what I love is about, you know, we all focus on wanting to capture a picture of a subject. And, you know, after a while, we get those field guide kind of, you know, shots down. You know, we should start looking more at a location, the light, where it's, where it's hitting that location, um, you know, different times of the year. So for these two shots, um, I started realizing that in around October, end of October into November, um, the position of the sun, where it would come up, it would strike this foliage in the back where these widgeons were hanging out and would reflect this beautiful, like in this portrait, no joke, that color in there is barely enhanced at all. Like a little touch maybe of, of warmth, but no vibrancy, nothing. That is how it was out of camera. Um, so, you know, planning out that, that type of shot, I mean, it took me a number of years. Again, I, I generally only get out, you know, twice, maybe throughout a week. Um, so it takes me a little bit more uh, time to get these types of shots. But, yeah, just, you know, finding those. Every, I always say that every, every spot, every lake, every pond or whatever, they have this magic spot. Mm -hmm. And once you find it and once you know when that light is going to hit that at that particular time, you can get some something special. And, again, you know, these ducks, again, a little bit more habituated to people now um, over time. But, you know, use that to your advantage to capture those unique images. Um, so, yeah, so those two are my yeah. definitely. Favorite. Yeah, that's great. And you raised a couple good points. Uh, one of the things I love to get waterfowl in fall, it's, it's a little more of a wild card, but you get those great colors. By the time March rolls around, all the trees are shed. There's really not a lot of color left. Now you can do it um, sometimes with far horizons. You know, I showed a couple where we had blue water and broke in in, in a far background that was blurred out. But the watercolor in the fall is really, and, and the, the nicest watercolor I ever got was definitely like late October where the trees were just hanging on to red and the whole water just lights up with it in the morning. So absolutely great I call on that. It's amazing, yeah. Yeah, perfect. All right, well, let me look, let me look over to the channel. Uh, thanks, Mark, for the compliment. Uh, Lori Anderson's calling some of your stuff gorgeous. If anybody has a question while we have Brad on, I know we went a little longer, so we're not going to do a long Q&A, but if there's anything we can answer before we wrap up, we'd be happy to do it. Uh, if not, I will tell you, we, we've been going about once every four weeks. Uh, we'll probably schedule another one. I don't necessarily have anyone lined up or a subject, but I have a couple ideas. I always encourage people in the comments, go ahead and leave some ideas if there's something you want to see. Uh, I'm thinking about a technical guest, somebody that really is just going to answer questions about anything. Uh, so I've got a couple brainiacs out there that are way smarter than me that I'm thinking about. A, a subject maybe like engagement, how to create engaging photos no matter what the subject is. Um, we've never done a real episode. We did a warbler episode yet last year, so we may look at that as spring comes. Uh, with waterfowl, you've got a couple weeks left in the northeast, so they'll be moving through um, soon, and they'll start to head up north a lot. Some of them will hang around all summer, but these are mostly migratory birds, the pretty ones anyway, so take advantage of that. Uh, I would like to thank you, Brad, for coming on the show. I think you did an amazing job and thank a you, really Sean. great photograph, so loved having yeah. you. Yes, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate you having me on. It's okay, been great. Yeah, and let me just see if there's one or two more questions. Looks like some compliments coming in, so we'll take the compliments. We'll roll with that. I'm going to sign out and just wish everybody a great night. Uh, when we, uh, I see your question, William. We will speak about sharpening and stuff like that on a technical episode. Um, all right, now we're getting questions, Brad. We're going to have to answer them. Do you guys generally <laughs> target right. smaller lakes or ponds or large reservoirs? Larger is harder generally. Uh, and if there's a large reservoir, you may get more birds, but harder looks. Uh, studying anything, whether it's a small lake or a reservoir, and you heard it from Brad, um, I tried and, and I know a couple people around, hey, what's, what's going on on this lake? Where are they at? Are they in good spots? But the coves on larger lakes can often be productive. You have to remember what kind of species. Some species, 
Um, dabblers, they need to be around the edges to get their food source. And some of the divers will be more productive in along the edges. So again, if you kind of know the lake, um, there's not necessarily a one size fits all. The buffle head I got was on a huge lake. Uh, some of the other ducks I get are on much smaller bodies of water, like small ponds. All right. All right. I'm going to wrap it up. All right, Brad, thanks for coming on. Uh, no enjoyed problem. having you. I will talk to you soon offline and we will close it down. Have a good night, everybody.